Well, good morning again to everybody. Those of you that have <laughs> known me for any uh, length of time know that I enjoy telling stories. In fact, recently uh, we were somewhere uh, visiting some folks and I just, for some reason, felt compelled to tell some stories related to what we were talking about, and somebody said, stories, stories, stories. Well, sharing parts of my life, the experiences I've had or witnessed with others, C.W. McCall once had a song, the Royal Borealis, where he says to his friends camping in the Bitterroot Mountains, I believe in Montana, he said, life is just a collection of memories. And you'll notice as you get older, you may tell more stories. But I've always found that conveying some of those in my life or what others I've experienced with them are beneficial and helpful. So some of you might say, yeah, I wish he would not tell so many stories. But others would say and have said, we like them. We learn from them. So whatever category you fall in, I'm going to keep telling stories as part of my messages. Because in storytelling and in writing, which frankly, uh, I heard somebody's watching again. Can you hear that? Clearly as a bell. It's like somebody just hit me with a ping. <laughs> ping! Apple watches, you got to love them. Um, in storytelling and writing, often simple, minor characters meaning not a major, perhaps considered not as important as other folks. They had color, these, these stories, these characters. They had insight and depth to the primary relationships that we have recorded. Within God's word, within this, there are major characters, but there are also a plethora of minor characters, multiple ones. And in the stories in history that we have recorded in scripture, we see a lot of these. The last couple of Friday night pastoral letters, which I hope you're getting those, uh, if you have Gmail, they have tightened down the spam filters, so I'm sending it out via constant contact. It's going out, but it's dumping it into your uh, folders. So some of you are not getting it. It's not me. Uh, it's coming out, going out, the analytics come back that, that it went to your uh, IP address. So in those letters, the last couple of Friday nights, we talked about one of the heroes of the Bible, Joseph. I hope you read those. I take a considerable amount of time to prepare those and give thought and, and write those. Um, we focused on Joseph, and we did mention some other people in the story albeit pretty briefly. Now, you and I might have been impressed at times with the leadership abilities of famous Bible servants, or in this case, men, like Paul, John, Peter, James, the list goes on, Stephen. It is worth noting, though, that there were many other men and women, notice I said women, men and women, mentioned in passing in Scripture. Just mentions a brief thing and then moves on. God does not have things recorded in His Word just because He felt like inspiring someone to, like so many books nowadays. You walk along, I was walking in Target the other day and here was another book by a famous, uh, if you will, or infamous president's wife. Uh, and I thought, oh, not another one. And I look at the title, it was like, oh, not another one. Just fill it with words, you know, and somehow because you're famous, those words. Well, God's word is different. When there's things recorded, very specific reasons for that, for your and my edification, not just to make money and sell a book. Sorry. That's why people that are famous write books. Because they make a lot of money on them. Very few people write books because they just feel like writing books. I had an uncle who was a very wealthy man, deceased now, uh, that 
uh, he, uh, he, I believe he owned a uh, publishing company, but he also uh, is one of his many things he did. But he wrote many books. I have many in my library upstairs. There's several, I'd say a dozen at least. And, but I asked him one time, why do you write so many books? He says, I want to have recorded my thoughts for somebody to benefit from. I said, what do you make money? He says, I don't know. I don't care. I'm not in it to make money. So there are people like that, but not very many. The devotion that these servants that are just mentioned in passing and their service to God and his people gives you and me fascinating and great insight into what godly leadership looks like in real life, in action, if you will. You know, my father-in-law is known, as I quote him often, to say we have to live this life. Well, living it means you have to have action. You have to do something. Become involved. Own it, if you will. You can talk the talk. You can live it. You can show up now and then. But do you live it all the day? So what is it like when you put it into action? I'd like to briefly stop today. Ponder and consider an individual, one such example. I'll be doing this often, occasionally, because as you read through God's Word, sometimes you're like, huh, I never heard of this guy. Who is this person? Now, I know you have this one, perhaps. How many of you remember this person? I'm just going to tell his name. That's the title today. It's just the name. Epaphroditus. Anybody remember that? Epaphroditus. We don't know a ton about him, but he seems to have been a native of Philippi. Let's go to Philippians 2, verse 25. Philippians 2, verse 25. It just simply says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send you to Epaphroditus. Okay, by the way, he was the... Uh, no, no, never mind. I just had a thought, which I don't need to share. Uh, to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that you had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God in mercy, not him only, but on me also. He said, I said him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, the Lord, with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Respect. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh to death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Now, he's only mentioned in the book of Philippians. He's only mentioned in the book of Philippians. And what we know of him is only what is recorded here. But what was just written in those few verses, what an example. If all God could record of you was these things that were mentioned here, what would that be to him and to others? I often in my life have tried and continue to try, emphasis try because I'm human, to consider the servants of God in his word and ask myself, how might I emulate or live as that person did? I don't do that with very many human beings. Uh, not even I could count the number of human beings I've done that in my life on one hand or less. So do you stop when you read about some of these minor mentions of people here. You know, not a lot said, not chapters or books or ver many verses. <clears throat> Do I live as that person did? It makes the Bible, when you do that, become much more alive, not stagnant. But it makes us consider who we are and how we live. The Apostle Paul mentions four things about Epaphroditus. Four things. Let's look briefly today at what is recorded from the Apostle Paul. I'll let you know, just to save you going back and reading it again, here's the four things he's recorded as, and then we'll go through and talk about them a little bit. 
First of all, it says he is a brother. What does that mean? It next says he is a fellow worker. What does that mean? It next says he is a fellow soldier. What does that mean? And then finally it says he is a messenger. What does that mean? The Greek word brother means one from the same womb or a member and heir of the same family. Do we not ourselves often refer to each other as brethren or brothers and sisters of what we do? You know, when I see my good friend Stephen Glover, I say, and he will too, hello, brother, because I consider him a brother. There are many people I do that to. When we say, when I write in my opening letter every Friday night, brethren, co-workers, fellow laborers, but brethren, when it comes right down to it, do we actually, I want you to think, I, do, I choose my words carefully, do we live and treat each other as if we were indeed one family? Do we do that? If we were to have, again, I, you know me, I'm going to be open and honest and transparent, and whether you like it or not, I'm going to tell you sometimes what God's word inspires me to say. And in this case, when it comes right down to it, if we were to have to live together, I dare say some of us would be in trouble. Because we can see each other once a week, okay? And we are together for a while and then we go our merry ways or back home and do our lives. But think about it for a minute. Think about your, maybe your idiosyncrasies, your OCD you have on certain things or how you want things done. I find this interesting at the Feast of Tabernacles. You have the family that lives together all year and you put them with the kids in, in a hotel room as it used to be. After eight days, you need to go back home where there's more room. <laughs> Don't you? How long are you going to be in the bathroom? Right? Well, Dad just went in there to pray. It's the first time he's had three minutes. <laughs> Come on, I need to use the bathroom. I need to take a shower. Or whatever, right? Or, so, let's talk about this a little further. Part of becoming a family is being one, not playing to be one. Oh, here he goes again, right? I'm not pointing fingers. I've been in a couple different fellowships in my life. I've been in another one now. Hopefully won't be another one, but you never know. <laughs> right? So look at your life. Over the years as one of God's servants, I can tell you, frankly, me and you could use at times some serious examination and course correction and how we live as a family. Don't just talk about it. You have to have action in how you do it. Do you demand your standards be on everyone else? And if they all do your standards, then everybody's happy. And don't tell me, oh, we don't do that anywhere now. What does society do? If you all do what I say, you'll be happy. And the other side says, you all do what we say, you'll be happy. The problem is you have so many people saying, and, you know, I, I watched a movie. Uh, it's kind of, the language is rough, called Jungle. Uh, it's a true story from 1981. Young men that went to Bolivia and went out in the jungle foolishly, in my opinion, totally unprepared, with a guide that they thought was a guide to go find these ancient Indians and, and native people that lived there. And in this concept, as he went through and his whole life unraveled, and he just almost died, it was like 19 or 20 days, uh, he said, you know, what's really important isn't trying to control everything like man always does. 
God created it this way. This is nature. What does man try to do? We try to control everything. Do we not? How you live, where you live, what you eat, what you pay taxes on, how you think, it starts from kindergarten on up. Parents try to control their children. Now, it's one thing to guide and direct. The Hebrew says, raise up a child as, when he is, as he gets older, he will not forget. But you don't control the child. I've made that mistake. If I can just control the situation, everyone will be safe. If you've ever been in live combat, you realize, oh, all the things you learned in the classroom don't always happen that way. When you're driving down the road, do all the other people do exactly what they're supposed to do based on driving etiquette? Do you? Right? Then you could go on and on and on. And so the history of the church, the body of Christ has been one of unity at times and the world, but overall, frankly, just the opposite. James said, and we're going to look at several verses here. From whence come squabbles and fighting among you. Remember, we're going back. Epaphroditus, Paul said he was a brother. From whence come squabbles and fighting among you. The answer is pretty to the point, you might say. Let's read. I want to read the whole chapter. And this is God's word. So if you get angry with me and upset that I'm always bashing or attacking or I'm angry, I'm not angry. I am in a righteous way, but I'm looking in the mirror at me and I'm saying, can I, does that reflect with you? Are we human beings? Can we examine something and change it? I can give you messages that are just soothing and wonderful to hear and Christian living and everybody's happy. Is that what you want? There's plenty of places you could find that. Go for it. James chapter 4. Verse 1, we're going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read it. I'll try not to comment too much, but I'll read it. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Not peace, this time of year. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. You know, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. That stopped on Black Friday when you didn't get in line where you wanted or get what you want because you wanted a piece of this and a piece of that instead of peace. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Do they not come even of your own lusts that were in your members? You lust and you don't have. You kill. Or, you know, you, you envy and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you don't have because you don't ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Now here he's talking about the spiritual aspect. You adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that... The, here's the thing. We have a responsibility to live this, to read it, to God's, God's talking to us here, okay? I'm relaying it as a messenger. But God is speaking his living, breathing word right now. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Boy, this is getting right down to it. Do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? But he gives more grace. Wherefore he said God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Can you and I be more humble? Or are we quick to give our opinion? Control, formulate, correct. Peter came right out and corrected Jesus Christ. That didn't go well, did it? Submitting yourselves, therefore, to what? To God. Resist the devil. Do we resist the world and the devil? And he will flee from you. Somebody once said, well, I tried that and he didn't leave. Well, maybe 
Maybe you weren't drawing and submitting to God. Because just going to church, just praying, just singing praise music, you know, and being moved and emotionally, oh, it's so touching, until you hear the words and they don't follow the Bible, which is pretty common right now. There's a hymn that I love. It moves you called Holy Water. The problem is it's doctrinally incorrect. It's not in the Bible. But they love it. You can hear that boom, boom, tsh, boom, boom. Just great. You're like, wow. Wait a minute. Did you hear what they just said? You're not going to heaven when you die. Some of you say, well, that's your opinion. The Bible says what? In John, no person has ascended to heaven except Jesus Christ. End of discussion for me. I'm not going to teach what's not in the Bible. You like me or you don't. I'm sorry. I have to teach the truth. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. So we have to do action, our part. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded. Joe talked about that a little bit this morning. The gray area. Double-minded. If you don't know what double-mindedness is, listen to any politician. <laughs> any leader nowadays. Oh, well, so-and-so's not that way. Yes, he is. Uh-huh. And that's what everything buddy's so good at sniffing out, even with me and you. You know me. I know you. I could point out double standards. You could point out double standards with me. God says, draw nigh to God, he will draw. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Be afflicted and mourn for the whole world, not just that woe is me. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Some people can never carry a serious conversation on to save their life. We used to have potlucks and uh, even around the dinner table at times, folks, and you could never have a serious discussion. I asked one time, what do you do during Bible study? It was just like everything was funny, ha-ha, always teasing, bantering, picking on, but to have a serious discussion. God says here, be afflicted and mourn and weep for your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So maybe if things in your life you haven't been given the opportunity, you know, the society says just do it because you deserve it. I love the old slogans. You deserve a break today. Have it your way. Right? Just mow over whoever's in your way and go for what you want because you deserve it. If you sit a little, it's okay. You deserve it. Grasp onto it now before it fleets away from you. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother, we heard about that too. There's a difference between judging and condemning, folks. Well, you can't judge me. Yes, I can. Looking into the perfect law of liberty, I can say that's not how I'm supposed to live. I didn't condemn you. That's God's job eternally. He'll decide for you and me. But we are to judge. If you've been woken... You don't judge anybody or anything. It's all good. You can do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. Remember that commercial? He that speaks evil of his brother judges his brother, speaks evil of the law, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Talking about the law of God. It also applies to some of men's laws. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you that judges another? My standards are better than yours. My worship services are better than yours. Fill in the blank. My political party is better than yours. My choice of what I eat is better than yours. And the list goes on. Go 
to now you that say, to dare and borrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, buy and sell and get gain. And he talks more about that in chapter 5, you rich men. Verse 14, whereas we know that what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor. Those of you that vape, I don't, never have, never will, unless I lose my mind. Vaping is not good for you. There's a paid political announcement. But it's not good for you. Okay, they've proven that. But people sure like to do it. In fact, we were on a plane flight recently where a young man went into the bathroom and vaped. And they came out and confronted him and said, did you just set the smoke alarm off because you were vaping? I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, don't lie to us. We, it just went off and you came out. And we can smell it. Duh! So they had this discussion, and the co-pilot came back and said, give me everything you have, or we're going to have you taken off the plane. We're going to land and have you taken off the plane. Oh, he was all mad. Oh, I got the right. Vaping, smoking, it is a federal law. They should have probably landed and just booted him off the plane. But then how dare we judge him? He needed that vape. We've come to a society where it says what? Our life is a vapor. Many don't believe that. That appears for a little time and then, as Psalm 78, 39 says, it vanishes away. I used to do drawings, perspective, to where you had a vanishing point. And eventually all things go away. I have some new glasses that have They've changed the lens a little bit, and I can see much better. But there reaches a point, he said, this is the best you're going to see with this eye, ever. Even with surgery. This is what you're going to see. This eye is 20-20, but this one is going to be not that. So as I get older, it's going to get worse. Do you not, any of you that are here and out there that are older, you need more light, maybe you need cataract surgery, a new lens, and eventually they say, we can't do any more for you. You're going to go blind. And you just say, well, my vision has vanished into thin air. No, it took 60, 70, 80, 90 years in most cases, not all. For what you ought to say is, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And that becomes a commonplace saying. Well, God willing, they just rolls off the tongue. There's no thought in it. But do you think about everything you do, God willing? Is it God's will? Am I living God's will? Or am I living my will through what I think God's will is? But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good. Here's an expansion of the definition of sin. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to that person it is sin. So if you talk the talk, but you never do it, you appear very religious on the Sabbath, but you don't live that way the rest of your week. You talk about giving to the poor, but you never do it. Fill in the blank, whatever it is that you know to do, but you don't do it. God doesn't strike you down. But what is the wages of sin? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And so we go through and we see these verses in the context of might you and I do better at being a brother or a sister in the faith by following what this says? Could we do better? Now, let's move forward. Although Paul was an apostle, I want you to listen carefully to this. Again, I choose my words carefully. Although Paul was an apostle, he viewed Epaphroditus, what does it say? As a fellow worker. Translate that, or an equal in service. The Greek word translated here is also fellow soldier. 
In verse 25, it is S-U-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-T-E. That would be pronounced Sustratioti, I think. Which means co-campaigner or associate, but engaged in the same service or battle. Well, what does that mean? I served for a few months as an associate pastor many years ago. What it meant was, I was told this, and what it meant was, by normal people, I was not somehow subservient to the pastor area I moved in with, but I worked with, I was not someone to be trained, brand new, but I was told you are an associate. You're both pastors. You work together. At the end of the day, if there's something major goes down, he gets in trouble if it goes wrong. <laughs> but you are an associate. You work together. Now some have taken exception to that. It meant we worked together. We were a team. I wasn't over him, and he was not over me. That's what I was told until I got there. So what I began to, to ask myself was, and I asked those over me, and they said, okay, they came down and split us up and said, this ain't working because he doesn't understand what an associate is, and you do, and so they split us up. You take these three churches, and you take these four. Or you take these four and these three. I don't remember now, but... We were engaged in the same service. Unfortunately, within the history of God's children and people, which is what most of my life is, and in the world, we forget so often that you and I are engaged in the same service or the same battle. As Paul said, the fellow worker, also a fellow soldier. When we are in the same battle, and by the way, do you know what battle we're in? There's a war going on right now that most people don't even know about because it's not all over the media. It's a spiritual battle. Outweighs all these other battles going on that will happen. Way, way bigger. But yet, I don't hear no movement and banging and slaughtering and crying and screaming going on. You remember the story when Michael and Gabriel, I believe one of them, maybe Michael said, I'm sorry I'm late. I, for seven weeks I've been fighting this battle or this part of the universe. There's a spiritual battle going on. And if it were not for the grace of God and protection, you'd be snuffed out in an instant. So would I. Boom. Done. Killed. Get rid of all humans. Any of them that are trying to follow God because I don't have time for family and a brother and fellow soldiers and fellow workers. It's a spiritual battle. I laugh. I tell stories. I joke. But I also have a serious side. And we are at a time in history. I hope you're listening. We are at a time in history. Brethren, salvation is nearer than you think. Are we awake or are we asleep? Oh, come on, relax, Scott. Chill. Laugh a little. I do. But when we're looking at God's word, even what he says, what is joy, what creates joy, we know Christ is coming back, that focus, but we're in a battle. When you're in a battle, I don't know. I hope not, but if you're mowing people over with a machine gun, if you're in a physical battle, are you laughing and joyful when you do that? When Christ comes back and there's this great battle at Armageddon, do you think he's going to be happy? Finally, I get to murder all these beings that I created to be part of my family. I don't think so but it has to be done. Because mankind is so recalcitrant, so stubborn, so pompous, so filled with vanity. And frankly, not just the world, but within the body, there are many 
of us at times that fall into that, that we reject what God says he wants us to be doing. And so, we are engaged in the same service. What we see in Epaphroditus is a man, a list of godly leadership attributes. Joe talked about, I believe, we're training to be leaders and servants and help. What we see in the example of Epaphroditus is a man who God, of God who selflessly served God's people. His focus was on God and those God gave him to serve. Now, his own safety, his own comfort came after taking care of others. He labored tirelessly so others would have the best possible relationship with the Father to the point of sacrificing his own health. Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. Let's go back and read that. Again, Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. He was a servant for Paul in that he served the people of Philippi on his behalf. The Greek word translated, interestingly here, ministered at the end of Philippians 2.25 that we read is lateros. It was used to describe those who served at the temple. My friends, God has called you and me, all of us, as associates, fellow laborers, fellow soldiers in Jesus Christ, to serve others. He has called you and me to lay down our life for others. Are we caught up in self-preservation in our own little worlds? Or are we thinking, how can I help others? Only you, only I, can determine what that is with our discussion with God in private. And if needed, which it is for all of us, to make a course correction. He has called us to serve his temple. Part of that body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is right here. Again, this goes back to what we talk about, becoming a family, where he said he was a brother. We are brethren. We're a family. We don't just say that on paper. You know, remember the song, we are family, okay? Yeah, there's physical parts, but the greater part is which God wants us to make the shift. Some of us get drugged down in our own personal physical families with all the stuff, the drama, the problems. We've got to have... A family, that's all that's important. You know what, you do that, you forget. You forget that all these people out here are your family. Do you remember what Christ said? Behold your mother. And then he said, behold your family. Yeah, they're not our family if they're not part of our political party. They're not part of our country. They're not part of our fellowship. Fill in the blank. They're not, when I say fellowship, our church. I'm not talking about Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping churches, which people think I'm hammering on that. Well, if you were Catholic, you'd be all right, buddy. Or you were Presbyterian or Lutheran or Southern Baptist or Evangelical or whatever, Ecclesiastical or Greek Orthodox. I could go on and list until I run out of names. What is it divides us? From whence come wars and squabblings? Do you know why there was the Protestant Reformation? The Reformed this and that? Because they, didn't, they had to separate. Well, that means you just all stay together. No, if the truth is there, yes. But it says if the truth isn't there, don't be part of it. It gets kind of 
gray, doesn't it, Joe? <laughs> a gray area, as he was talking about. It becomes a gray area. Not really. Not when God's word is involved. And you're convicted, and you must do the right thing, and you say, no, I haven't left. Right? Why am I not involved in politics? I'm neither independent, Republican, or Democrat, or whatever else there is. Because God says what? My kingdom is not of this world. I'm a soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. So that solves that discussion. Oh, you're just an empty head. Come on, you can get involved in politics. What are you thinking, man? What's your problem? You've got to do your part. You've got to make a difference. I can make a difference by submitting my life to God. And so can you. And living it and with action. And realizing there's your family. Uh, not that guy. Not that lady. Yeah, those I like. Not that one. Not that one. But you, you can come. That's not how God works. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And so, that temple, while his given name, Epaphroditus, means devoted to Aphrodite, which was a pagan goddess of love, after he was baptized, he, he obviously turned the meaning of his name around and became voted to what, devoted to what? The true God. The real God of love, which is not a wonderful song or a feeling or a moving, a stirring. That could be part of it. If you love me, listen carefully. God says, if you love me, keep, observe, do with action, live my commandments. And by the way, you know how many there are? Ten. That fourth one about the Sabbath, we can take that one away because it's gone. We got rid of that one. And the one about thou shalt have no other gods, number two, we can take that one away because we don't have to worry about that one. And you start picking away and pretty soon you get to where there aren't any because you remove them from the schools because we've been awakened to Freedom. Christ nailed those to the cross. No, he didn't. Sorry. The question arises for you and for me. Once we've repented, we've become baptized, had the laying hands on of us and received God's Holy Spirit, have we changed who and where we are devoted to? Where's our focus? Where's your focus? Oh, my health? Oh, my job? Oh, my family, physical family? Oh, my pets? Oh, my house? Oh, my friends? Where's your focus? Because God says he's a jealous God. We are to put him first. You shall have no other gods before me. So Paul heaps praise on Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 to 30. But more than that is the recognition God gave from God, not men, to Epaphroditus by having his service preserved in Scripture. How many men... I want you to think about this question with me. How many men and women like Epaphroditus have there been over the centuries who served anonymously in this world and in the church of God or the body of Christ? But you never hear anything about them because maybe they weren't ordained or they weren't on a television show or a YouTube channel with messages or elevated in front of the congregation to have positioned. They just went about living this. Do you and I, do you and I live up to the example of Epaphroditus' selfless service? 
Finally, I want to talk about this briefly. Our Christian example, that of helping spread the gospel, that good news of this coming kingdom of God, which is good news, it's coming. I may die before Christ returns, but I guarantee you, remember this, write it down, I said it, I believe it, you believe it, the kingdom of God is coming. Being a messenger in his service must ring strongly to this world. It must ring strongly to this world. How do we live? This is a perfect time of year. How do we live? You're not going to hear me saying, Merry Christmas, because that's not the Bible. Well, but that won't go over well. That'll tick people off. This is the most wonderful time of year. So the song says. All right? Why not say, I don't observe that. What? Weirdo? Fruitcake? Unwoken? Wake up! It's Christmas! I never dreamed of a white Christmas because white is snow and snow is pretty. Actually, snow's in the Bible. Frozen water's in the Bible. But Christmas isn't. Do your research. If I prick your heart and say, well, what's his problem, man? Get off it. Just overlook it. Go along. Get along. Because the holidays have been so many. Thanksgiving is in the Bible, the approach to being thankful. I'm okay with that. But Father's Day, Mother's Day. But Valentine's Day, sorry, that's not in the Bible. That's of pagan origin. God hates that. Christmas, God's not part of it. You can't put Christ back in Christmas because he never was. The birth of Christ has nothing to do with Christmas. And we're not even supposed to celebrate his birth. It says, commemorate my death until I come back. Look it up in your Bible. Please, that's all I ask. Epaphroditus lived as a messenger for God. You're a messenger, you're a messenger, you're a messenger, and I am a messenger. We are all associates, fellow servants, brothers, fellow soldiers, fellow messengers. I'm glad Epaphroditus is recorded in Scripture for you and me. You and I would do well to emulate such a man of God, such a person of God, as we serve mankind, as we serve brethren, his people. This world desperately needs faithful children of God to become a family with his spirit, the same spirit that Jesus Christ and God the Father have, to unite and work together for what God called us to do. Go back today in Philippians and read about Epaphroditus prayerfully, would you? Through this week, ask yourself, could my name be put in there? Yet I suppose necessary to send you, verse 25, Scott, Paul, Gail, Harry, Joe, just Joe, whoever, put your name in there. Could you be recorded for that? Oh, but would you be recorded as a person who demanded everyone do things the way you do? Because you're right. These are some serious things to think about. I hope they're helpful. I hope they're encouraging. I hope as we finish this Sabbath, it will give you time to ponder and think about many of the not so major individuals recorded in the Bible. That's why God called them the minor prophets. I call them the not-so-minor prophets because they may be smaller books, but they're really filled with a lot of helpful insight on how to live and change. So let's go to God in prayer and close, if we will, today. Our Father in heaven, great God, we come before you. Thank you for your patience and mercy and your love. And Father, we learned a lot from Epaphroditus today and just his service. There's so many others. 
Father, help us to glean from Scripture, to spend the time with our, the Word of God, to look and study and research and the history, to understand what actually took place, why. And then, Father, help us to seek you with all our heart. If my people, who were called by your name, Father, would seek you with all your heart, we know the answer to what will take place. We pray for this nation. We pray for those that claim to be religious, Father. They claim to be Christian. Help them. Wake all of us up from this nap that we are in. And help us, Father, to rededicate our lives for the time we have left in service to you and to fellow man. So we ask your blessing now, your dismissal. We pray you'll bless the meal that we're about to partake of. And all those watching, if they're having potlucks or meals, please bless those as well. Father, thank you for this calling. Thank you for the truth. And we praise you. And we ask this in the name, but by the authority of Jesus the Christ. Amen.